Hey folks, Quilly Team here, and welcome to Let's Try Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms. As might be implied by the name, this is an idle game, which is a subset of the incremental game genre, which includes things like clickers and, and things like that. They are games that are based on numbers continuously getting bigger, often in an exponential way. And with idle games in particular, they are games that somewhat play themselves. You know, you do a little bit of clicking, you do a little bit of this, a little bit of sort of setup and things like that, but then you kind of let the game grind on its own while maybe you're doing other things. In fact, you can even shut down this game and it will continue to run in the background. Um, it's all saved on servers and things like that. It is free to play, but if you do take a look at this on say Steam or the Epic Game Store or something like that, you will note that there are a lot of monetization options, a lot of what they call DLC, but really the DLC is um, will be skins, as, as a couple of quality of life things and some game acceleration options, but literally nothing that you need to play the game. The problem though, and this is a big warning for this game, this game is very compelling and hard to put down. And if you've got the right kind of personality or the wrong kind of personality, it's definitely this thing that's going to keep you very locked in for a very long time. In fact, some people have been playing this game for years and years and years. I didn't pick it up right away when it came out. Um, originally, uh, because I don't, I think I, I, I heard a couple of people grumbling about something or something. And at the time I was like, oh, I don't know. That doesn't sound like the sort of thing I want to play, despite the fact that it is D&D themed. However, a few days ago, I did finally decide to start playing this and I cannot stop. It is really interesting because to me, it is sort of at the intersection of some of the gameplay I like from incremental games like Cookie Clicker or Universal Paperclips. Um, but also, I really like auto battler games. I'm talking about Dota Underlords, Hearthstone Battlegrounds, Team Fight Tactics, for example. And to me, this adds in certain features of those auto battlers that I really enjoy, but in a, in a single player kind of style. Let me show you what the game playing is like, and then I'll, I'll talk about some of the more features and the meta uh, characteristics of the game. Number of different campaigns to choose from, uh, including uh, events that happen. So there's currently a Simril event that's happening. One thing that did surprise me and really impressed me about this is there does seem to be a lot of um, developer attention still being paid to this game uh, with new events, new champions being released for it. Uh, also a lot of support for sort of streamer communities, uh, we've, whether it's people streaming this game or even people doing, you know, Twitch streamed D&D campaigns. Well, they will actually have pop-ups in this game to let you know that one of those streams is live. And if you go to it, you can get codes to unlock more chests for this, which is really good sort of cross pollinization of the, the, the uh, community, a good way to promote Dungeons and Dragons content, even if it is unrelated to this game itself. I found that really impressive and that caught my attention and is one of the reasons I started going. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load up one of the adventures here in the Grand Tour of the Sword Coast campaign. I'm just gonna do the Cursed Farmer, which is the very first outside of the um, tutorial. It is the very first adventure that you will do. So we're gonna go ahead and get this started and we'll see exactly how this works. It's gonna load itself up, and this is basically what you're gonna see at the start. We've got some enemies coming in from the right, we get a little bit of flavor text, oh, found out the cursed cow so you can search the area, uh-huh. And we start with one champion in play, which should be Brunor for you, which is what we've got here. Brunor, if you are used to what I would call the Dritz Dwarden series of books, he is one of Dritz's companions in the, the Companions of the Hall, uh, this guy over here. And uh, you see he starts off at level one, and he attacks for a certain amount of damage. Now. I have unlocked a lot of items for Brunor here, so his base damage is quite high for level one to the point where he is absolutely uh, one-shotting everything. I know that looked like the cow just took damage there, but it wasn't from Brunor, it was in fact from me clicking, because you can click in this game. You can click on a specific enemy to target it, uh, so if there are multiple enemies on the board, I could target a particular one. The rat doesn't count, that's considered a distraction. Oh, there you go, there would be a good example. I can do that. Or if you just click anywhere, it'll just hit the frontmost enemy. By default, your clicks do one damage per click, not a whole heck of a lot of damage, but every time an enemy dies, they drop gold, and the gold can be used to upgrade a variety of things. So here is my click damage, for example. It's currently doing one damage. If I spend 50 gold, it'll now do two, then four, then eight, then 17, 35. Um, so effectively doubling on every single click over here. Uh, so now I'm, I click powerfully enough that I can one-shot the cows. Now. The amount of gold I'm getting is ridiculous right now for what we would have if you were starting the game. Because one of the big mechanics in this is you go as far into the adventure as possible. And the first time you play the adventure, it's got a particular goal. Reach level 50. And if you do that, you'll be rewarded with X things. It could be a new champion. Usually it's going to be some gems. Gems are one of the mechanics that you use to 
permanently strengthen your, your crew in a variety of ways that we'll look at over here. But one of the things that will also happen whenever you complete your adventure, and here I'm actually in what's called free play mode. I've already completed the Cursed Farmer adventure a long time ago. There, I have no objective, which means I don't get no bonus reward. I don't get a bunch of fat loot from reaching level 50, for example. So why am I still playing it? Well, because even if you've already completed it, Anytime you do an adventure, whether it's the first time doing it or the hundredth time doing the particular adventure, you can still earn favor. So what happens is whenever you complete the adventure, so at some point, what's gonna happen is as we go through the levels over here, is these enemies are gonna get progressively stronger and stronger. They get more hit points, they'll do more damage. The big thing is they're gonna have more and more hit points. So these rats have 20, these cursed cows over here have 20, but that's gonna keep going up exponentially until they have like, millions and billions and trillions of hit points because that's the nature of the gameplay here. Um, and at some point you're gonna hit sort of this wall that you can't get through. It's gonna be enemies that are just too tough and you're just not doing enough damage to get through them. And so you will want to to quit, you to exit this adventure, to complete the adventure. And I do like that they call it complete as opposed to, you know, abandoning it or whatever. Um, so I can do that anytime. And what happens when you complete the adventure, you earn a certain amount of favor with a particular deity that is the sponsor of this adventure. And that favor translates to a per permanent increase to your gold find rate. So currently I earn an extra 9 million percent gold from every enemy. Normally these enemies would drop, I don't know, a couple of gold or something like that when they fall. But if I mouse over here, you can see I'm picking up hundreds of thousands of gold pieces right now um, over here with, with you know, the, the, the rate that's going on. It's just ludicrous amounts of money. And this is a fraction of the amount that someone who's been playing this for months or years will be getting. These, these numbers just go like absolutely nuts. The biggest thing you do to spend uh, your gold is you do use it to level up characters and the cost does go up. So right now, actually I should do this, to level up Brunor from level one to level two would cost me five gold. There you go, he's now level two. I can go level three, four, five, and I can keep leveling up like this. And the cost to leveling him up is going to continue to increase. Um, and I can also unlock extra champions to be fighting at the same time. So I got Bruno on here, but he's feeling lonely. Let's go ahead and recruit Celeste. It's gonna cost me 50 gold to get a level one Celeste, but now she's on the board here and both of them are not gonna attack. So Celeste every 5.9 seconds, I've got some cooldown reduction. So I think her base is six seconds. She fires a guiding bolt at something. And right now is definitely gonna be powerful enough to one shot anything we run into. And I can get a few more party members, excellent. Hey, it's gonna cost me 50 million gold for the next one. So you can already see these costs start to ramp up, but not only is the cost to recruit more of these champions ramp up, but the cost to level these guys do as well. Now, leveling up a champion, you know, by one level, it seems to increase their damage a lot. You can see it doubled her damage. Well, at some point, the pure leveling isn't going to matter that much for the amount of damage they deal. The big thing starts to become the abilities you unlock. So every X levels, you will unlock a new upgrade or a new ability for your characters. So for example, Bruno over here at level five, actually gained an upgrade that I didn't trigger yet, I'm gonna do it now, it increases the damage by 100%. And then when I reach level 10, I also unlocked an upgrade over here, which is gonna increase the damage of Brunor by 100% for each adjacent champion. And now we get into the real meat and potatoes of the interesting part of this game is that uh, our formations. These are the big deal. So if I go ahead and give Brunor that, so right now he's hitting, uh, I believe this is his Okay, that's his actual damage per hit, about 400,000 damage. But if I just move him down here, so he's adjacent to more people, now he's gonna hit for 800,000 damage. So I've um, in dramatically increased the amount of damage he does. One of the big things with this game, and the reason these numbers are so ludicrous, is that all of these multipliers are, are they're multiplicative as opposed to additive. What do I mean by that? Let's say the base damage of one of these champions was 10 damage, and you got something that added 100% more damage. So he would double, he would go from 10 damage to 20 damage, great. If you got another 100% modifier, now in some games, this would always apply to the base, this would be additive. So if you kept stacking 100% modifiers on Brunor, or let's say, his, let's say his base damage was 10, you would expect it to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 with each multiplier. But in this game, the multipliers will multiply with each other. So instead of just um, doubling the base or adding 100% from the base every time, it doubles his active amount. So it would go 10, 20, 40, 80, 160, 320. And so you get this exponential curve in their damage. So he's got a variety of items over here that is increasing his damage or the ch damage of all champions, which includes himself. Um, and these are all multiplying together in pretty sexy ways. And then, 
you get the abilities that he's getting from these upgrades that multiplies it even more. Um, usually you probably won't, it's gonna start off in this like times one, so each click is one level. You can go to times 10, times 25, times 100 for levels. I really like being in this mode over here, the double arrow. What this does is it just levels up to the next upgrade and also unlocks the upgrade in sort of one click. So I tend to find that pretty useful. Um, Scroll, thank you. Uh, so for example, if I were to click on Brunor again over here, he's gonna have to level up 12 times. It's gonna cost me 169 gold, but it's gonna upgrade his next ability, which is gonna be his ultimate. So he's got his ultimate over here. Every champion's got one. They, they accrue over here. Their damage scales based on the hardest hit that your party is doing, not the actual damage of this one champion, which is really important because one of the things that you're gonna be doing as you go forward, hey, there's a familiar face, Minsk from Baldur's Gate. Um, you'll also see characters in here that are from perhaps your favorite, um, where's a good example? Here was another one. Your favorite online role-playing group, so Critical Role, so um, uh, the Penny Arcade, Acquisitions Incorporated group, like Omen Drawn over here. Uh, Evelyn, that's from Critical Role, for example, um, as well as other champions that I think are just made for this game over here. This will also include characters from your favorite DD books, like Bruno or Dritz Duarden, that sort of thing. Um, where was I going at it? Oh, formations, right? So this starts to become a big thing because uh, different characters have different bonuses. Some are pretty simple. So uh, Celeste over here. So she's got a few. Did I already upgrade the first one with the adjacency? Oh, yes. So uh, level 20, Celeste unlocks Crusader's Mantle, which increases the damage of all champions adjacent to her by a fairly large number, which will only grow as we continue to level her up. Oh, there's a little notification there about someone who is streaming something. Bardic Inspiration. I don't know who that is. Maybe they're uh, the Twitch stream, the roleplay group. I'll have to check it out after this because I'm finding a whole bunch of new cool channels to follow. Um, so Celeste will boost anyone who's adjacent to her in terms of damage. She also heals champions in the column ahead of her. And Bruno also has a positional thing where he increases increases the damage of anyone in the same column as him. So we're gonna take a look at that in just a second. Also, every champion at some point uh, does choose a specialization. Um, sometimes they're pretty dramatically different. Here, it's just a slight tweak to how Brunor's rally ability works, uh, either giving it a flat 100% bonus or giving it a bonus of 10% for every time a champion gets hit that can stack up to 250 times. So this can be a 250% bonus, which is clearly better 100%, or sometimes it's gonna be worse. I'm just gonna click on Battlemaster here just because it's not gonna matter for this particular run. If I mouse over Brunor, we can see a little green arrow. This arrow represents his rally ability, which is where he increases the damage. Uh, so his damage increases for each adjacent champion, but the biggest thing Brunor does isn't to deal damage, is to buff other people with a rally, where he increases the damage of other champions of the same column as him by a huge percentage. Because one of the things you will end up doing in this game um, is you will generally in your formation have one person who is going to be the DPS for your party and everyone else in your party is really gonna be all about buffing that character to apocalyptic levels. So um, a good example of a damage dealer early on will be Jarlaxle over here, uh, who stabs things for huge amounts of damage. And actually if they stay alive, then he'll stab another thing and another thing and another thing, um, you know, doing less damage every time. But he can like, he can wipe out a whole war a way of going whack, 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 whack. And then five seconds later, he'll restart and do the whole thing again. He's got a good base damage. Uh, one of his, his role is considered DPS slash gold because he does actually increase the amount of gold that you find, which is fantastic. And so early on, he'll be a good person for you to focus your damage on. So let's look at our structure here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and make sure I've leveled up and unlocked a few things. So Celeste, we're gonna unlock her war domain. Life domain potentially is better depending on formation, but it doesn't matter. We're just gonna do a little bit of this. I'm gonna make sure that Ne, what's her what's her name? Neyeli over here is, oh, I couldn't actually unlock her specialization. But that's gonna be okay. We'll level up a few here, a few here, and I'm not gonna do anything else for just a moment. So Nayeli over here is a tank. So it's a hint right there, tank support. Uh, she's quite good to be up front for a variety of reasons. Hit points, abilities that she develops, this overwhelm ability that is really important for tanks. So she does very good up front, not because she is quite survival, but one of the other things you can do with her is you see this thing where she's pointing to the back slots over here? She actually increases the damage of the people in the column behind her. Um... There we go. Or of court, courage. Increase the damage of the champions in the column behind her. So any champion that's in this back column will have will do increased damage. So we want our DPS character to be behind Nayeli if we can. So let's go and move Jarlaxle 
to behind Nayeli. And this right here, this is my uh, damage per second expectation. This is how much damage per section I'm expected to make. Currently at four quintillion damage. Uh, we can do a little bit better than that. Let's say I take uh, Brunor over here, and he boosts everyone in the same column as him. So let's put him in the same column as Dralaxel. Excellent, now I'm doing 18 quintillion damage. That's a, that's a great upgrade. And you can see it'll go down, It'll go up, really good indicator of what's going on. Now, uh, hey, how about Celeste over here? Well, she's got the ability where she increases the damage of anyone adjacent to her, right? Oh, she's gonna increase it by 1,548%. That's a pretty big number. So let me go and move her so that she ends up adjacent to Jarlaxel as well. Excellent, my damage is now 641 quintillion. Now, I think most people probably play this in scientific uh, notation, which is not on by default because at the start, you, natural numbers are probably a little easier to get a handle on. But at a certain point, these numbers just become so ridiculous that it's hard to remember the orders of magnitude. So I'm gonna turn on the scientific no notification over here, scientific notation. So now I can see my damage over here. This is a six followed by 17 zeros. And really it's the first number almost doesn't matter because it's only ever really gonna go from one to 9.99. Um, it's the second number, the number of zeros that starts to become the more important part. If I move uh, Celeste back here, we can see we're gonna lose a zero. If we move this, there you go, it goes up in E. So we're at E17 damage, which is almost the more important thing. Going from E17 to E18 means I'm doing 10 times more damage, right? We're adding an extra zero every time. Um, and so you can already see, okay, there's a little bit of formation stuff. What else comes into play as interesting math? Well, let's take a look at Ashara over here. So Ashara is quite interesting. I've got Ashara in play already. They are tagged as a DPS support. Um, so they can they can absolutely take over the DPS role. Right now, if I replace Jarlaxle in this spot, see Ashara wouldn't do quite as much damage. Although Ashara does fire a slew of magic missiles that can hit multiple things. Right now, we're doing enough damage to one-shot everything, so it doesn't really matter. But we'll put it back there. We're gonna try to maximize our damage. Okay, so that's that, that's fine. Um, Jarlaxle, or sorry, Ashara can easily out DPS um, uh, Jarlaxle. What tends to happen with the higher slotted characters over here as we move towards the right, their base damage tends to be much higher. Um, but when you first unlock him, like Minsk, Minsk is also a great damage dealer, right? If I unlock Minsk and I put him in this slot, damage is gonna go down. But um, his base damage is higher, but right now Jarlaxle has a bunch of built-in damage multipliers, so uh, Minsk isn't doing as well. So Jarlaxle's still better. But as we level up Minsk, he's gonna get more and more damage multipliers on himself that is going to make him a better DPSer than Jarlaxle at some point. There will be a break-even point. Same thing with Ashara, same with other people. But sometimes, only if you have the right mechanics happening. So I'm gonna level up Ashara over here. Ashara gets to pick her specialization um, the, at level 10, very, very early on. I don't know if there's anyone else who picks a specialization that early, but it is a big deal because with Ashara, her specialization is very simple. She forms a bond with members of certain species and boosts their damage. So Ashara can bond with humans and increase the human damage by 125%. Or with dwarves and elves, including drow, or dro if you prefer, boosting their damage, or the Popuri, which is Aarakocra, which is what Ashara is, Dragonborn, Furbog, Lizard Folk, etc. Um, and it, you get a little hint about how many things would be targeted with this. We got a lot of humans in the party right now, but the big question isn't generally how many it's gonna buff. The question is, are we gonna buff our our targeted DPS star? So right now, with Jarlaxle as my DPS star, I'd wanna pick Dwarves and Elves. But if I knew that this run was gonna go deep enough, that I was gonna be able to push far enough to the point where Minsk all of a sudden takes over in damage, or Ashara takes over in damage, or Jayella, I don't remember her name, she comes over here, uh, if they take over in damage, then I'm going to wanna to sort of plan that. And that mostly will happen. Like the, at first, you're gonna take Dwarves and Elves because you're gonna use Jalaxel as your DPSer and it's gonna be great. But you will at some point start to get the sense that, well, if I restart, I think at this point I'm pushing far enough. You can test, right? At some point I'm gonna put Minsk in there and if the damage is close while Jarlaxel is benefiting from the elf buff, then I know that if I were to restart and pick the human bond instead, Minsk would do more. And then the other character whose name starts with a J and I can't remember her name, um, she's also a human. So you can go you can uh, go from Minsk to there. You might still use Jarlaxel as your early DPS because even with uh, Ashara having the human bond, Jarlaxel will likely do more damage in the very early phase of the game, um, but then maybe fall back. Doesn't mean you, you bench Jarlaxel, although you can, you can pull them down here. You will probably 
probably want to keep Jarlaxle in there because they still increase your gold fine, right? My gold fine right now is nine to the E of six. If I put Jarlaxle back in, my gold fine is now an, uh, a one to the E of seven. So I've about doubled my gold fine, I think, in here. No, that's not accurate. Well, from a nine to a, basically a one point, uh, an 18, more or less. So I just about doubled my gold fine by putting Jarlaxle in here. Uh, so even though in his position, he's not going to be doing much damage, he's still going to be great, right? But right now, he's still doing more damage overall. So we're, we're powering through these things. That's great. I did talk about the clicking doing damage, and the clicking will, can do a lot of damage, especially when you got a lot of gold modifiers. Clicking also can happen really fast, right? All of your champions over here attack quite slowly, right? Uh, although when you got a good number of them, there's enough going on. It's not too bad. But clicking can happen instantly. And if you do boost the hell out of your click damage to the point where it's one-shotting everything, you can clear these waves slightly faster. Mostly you're still restricted to how fast um, they spawn. But with clicking here, I can definitely kill things a lot faster. And we're gonna talk about the first quality of life thing that you can pick up in this game, and those are familiars. So um, you can unlock familiars using gems, which we haven't talked about yet. And familiars basically click for you. So, if I put a familiar into play over here, so I'm just going to hold F, which is the hotkey on PC, or I can click familiar and get my list over here. I can just drag, say, the mage hand in here. This mage hand is clicking every, five times per second. And right now, it's click, it, it, the click damage is so high that it can one-shot all these things, which is great. But at some point, the click damage will fall behind a bit. But I'm still super lazy. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take another familiar. I'm going to take Croy over here, and I'm going to put him on the button that levels up my click damage. So now, every time I have enough gold to afford a click damage increase. The crow did it during the transition there, so you can see. The crow is gonna go ahead and click the damage, uh, increase my click damage, which is great. Hey, I can throw more familiars into play over here as well. There, now I got three. They're all clicking five times per second. So 15 times per second now, I'm hitting something for one followed by 13 zeros worth of damage, a pretty decent amount. The other thing that's kind of nice is this. Let me uh, let me go and pull one of these familiars out. Normally when you kill an enemy, they drop gold and potentially items, because sometimes to go through a level, you need to pick up a certain amount of items. Like this one here, I need to pick up 25 treasure chest keys to continue. After a few moments of them being on the ground, maybe about 10 seconds, they do automatically get picked up. You never have to do anything manually, but you can also just mouse over, well here, it picked up all the gold when it transitioned level. You never lose out on it, but you can mouse over to pick it up a little bit faster. If you get three familiars in play, they constantly pick up everything on the table as well, which mostly for the levels where you have to pick stuff up, it means that you go through the level a little bit faster. These familiars are very quality of life. Um, they are some of the things that you can spend money on, just a note, but you can also pick them up with gems. So let's talk about that. We've talked about gold. Gold is the primary way you get faster on, or you're more powerful on a particular adventure. But gems are your long-term permanent ways to embiggen your characters uh, substantially. Here, I just kill the boss. Bosses drop gems. Every five level, you get a boss. Boss drops bag bags of gems. And also, if you're not in free play, which is what I'm doing here, but if you're playing an adventure for the first time, you'll have a goal reach, reach level 50 or something, and then you'll be rewarded with 200 gems or something like that. What can we do with gems? Well, if you go into the shop over here, we'll see things. First of all, the gun, you will see things you can buy with money, but you can pl buy plenty of things with gems. If you go to the gem items tab, this is specifically gonna filter for things that you can you, you can spend gems on uh, by itself, right? If I go chest, I can see, okay, I can get chests that I can I buy them with gems or with money. Here, this will just filter to just gem things. Um, silver and gold chests, these contain items for your characters. And it is very important for your progression to get items on your characters. Uh, the rule of thumb that I was seeing posted for new characters is at the start, um, when you're, you got a new account, spend your gems on silver chests until all of your party members have, well, at least an item in every slot and ideally maybe a green item in every slot. So we can see at a quick glance over here with Brunor, he's got every character has six item slots, by the way. Uh, and those slots are locked in. So the first slot over here for Brunor is going to be, a, it's always an item that increases the damage of all champions. And different characters have different things in each slot, but it's always the same. So um, the second slot here for Jalak always will increase the ability of his master tuner ability. Um, you can get uh, sort of gray or common quality, green, blue, 
purple, and I think there's a shiny level or something like that. I don't know if I've got one. I might actually with one of my characters, something like that. Um, so you get these different tiers of it. You don't ever have to manually equip any of the items. Um, the best item in that slot automatically gets equipped. So if you had a green quality one and you unlocked, if I unlocked a blue quality hat, which is better, uh, then it would automatically equip that hat. If you get a duplicate, so let's say I have this green hat, if I get a second green hat, what it's going to do is it's gonna increase the, the, the number on this hat ever so slightly. Uh, so it's not a complete waste, although I think that caps out at a certain point as well. So if you're a new player, it is often suggested that you open your silver chests uh, and spend your gems on silver chests until all of your, your your characters at least have an item in each slot, each character that you're playing. Hey, there we go. I just unlocked the plain scarf for... Is that uh, that character that I can't remember the name of? I think so. Yeah, oh, Jamila is over here. Jamila is a great human DPSer. So I've just unlocked a plain scarf for her, uh, which I didn't have yet. Although probably I had an item in that slot, but I may have only had a gray level item instead of a green item over here. Uh, you can see I got a duplicate battle axe, but that's just increasing the effects. I have a blue one, actually. I got a gray, but it still counts as a duplicate um, and can still help you level up some cards in, in a variety of different ways. We'll open a second uh, silver chest over here. Ah, there you go. I got a duplicate of rip cloth for um, Tyrell, I think his name is, but it still, you know, potentially gets some value out of it. So at the start, it is recommended you just do silver because uh, they're much cheaper, right? They're 50 gems instead of 250 gems. Uh, gold chests do give you five cards in each one um, that can include a variety of things and has a better chance of higher quality items, but people mostly say silver chests, get yourself kitted out, it's quite good. Silver chests can also contain gold, and the more gold you earn on a particular adventure, the more favor you will earn when you GG out of it. But um, once you do that, I, one of the nice things to do is to pick up one of these, um, one of these familiars quite early on to get that auto click in there. Save your click finger, you'll go a lot faster. The mage hand is only 250 gems, so it's very early to get, easy to get early on. Um, reading old guides in this game, it looked like it used to cost a thousand gems, which is still pretty cheap. Uh, but at 250, it becomes really easy to grab early on. Oh yeah, so gold chests are 500, not 250. So yeah, they're 10 times as much. There's, you get a little bit more, but you don't get like 10 times worth stuff early on. But at some point, the silver chests start to fall off because you're really looking for those higher quality cards. Um, and the other thing is with uh, gold chests is you are guaranteed to get an epic every, I think, 10th chest or something like that. So if you got, there's a pity timer. So if you got really unlucky, you'll get epics guaranteed if you keep buying gold chests. So at some point you might want to look into something like that. Um, there's also tons of codes that you can find online to uh, unlock free stuff, free characters, um, Electrum chests as well, which have extra loot for you and that sort of thing. Uh, go to the Reddit. Uh, so it's called Idle Champions, Reddit dot com slash r slash idle champions people are very active about posting codes there it's not it's not a community that has like tons and tons of comments but there are going to be a few posts per day as these codes that you get from these live streams and various events like that uh just get collected and, and in one area so it's quite nice to get a continuous input of that um yeah oh god i forgot one other really important thing that dramatically impacts the strategy for your um your layouts over here there are different characters that you can have in different slots. So, um, in my slot one over here, which currently is Brunor, instead of using Brunor, I could use Kathris. I can never use both Brunor and Kathris because they both occupy character slot number one. Now, I mean, I can put them anywhere on the board, right? I can put Brunor here or here. I'm not talking about the formation. I'm talking about this slot right over here is either gonna be Brunor or Kathris. And those are my only two options currently. There are more people to unlock. I actually don't have any uh, alternate unlock in slot four for or Jaraxxal. Um, I have some slots have quite a bit. So yeah, Evelyn or Krull or Ashara over here. And that has a big impact on what kind of configuration you do. Uh, you could start with one. I can still swap. I can swap to Kathris. I'll unlock him so he comes in at level one. I can you know level him up a bunch, but he's gonna be fitting into a... Um, I, I'm not saying that was the right, I was just clicking a button for the specialization. He's gonna fit into the structure a lot differently because uh, whereas Brunor uh, buffs everyone in his column, Kathris by default dramatically buffs the person who's the furthest away from him. Unseen encouragement, increase the damage of the champions furthest from Kathris by 3000% because of all the modifiers. So right now the champion furthest from Kathris would be Ney, who's actually not one of my primary damage dealers. So it's like, oh, can I end up somehow, 
Well, that's quite interesting. If I put him at the bottom, he is equidistant from all those, so he is actually buffing Dralaxel. Sorry about the uh, Gmail bong in the background. That was a message that got to me. So now he's buffing everyone. Now, later on, I'm actually going to be able to upgrade him as we keep going a little bit further so that this buff, I believe, applies to everyone who's not adjacent to him. Uh, so the positioning becomes a little bit easier. Let's talk about this formation. That's one of the other things I want to talk about. So we got this sort of diamond formation over here. That is specific to this particular campaign, this diamond formation. One of the other things that breaks up the strategy, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bail on this run over here, which isn't going to do much for me, but that's okay. A little summary, we'll get rid of this. If I go to a different campaign, like the Tomb of Annihilation over here, it has a different format. It has this triangle um, formation. If I go to Waterdeep, things get even more dramatic. I get this weird loop with a hole in the middle. Um, in Simril, the event that's going on right now, there's a few more. We get this sort of offset diamond uh, for the crawl, but actually, if you go down the Lucius route, it's way different with a sort of two-prong kind of formation. So. You can't have a one-size-fits-all formation that you just use everywhere. Each one of these is different. Not only that, within a particular campaign, there are variants of adventures that might block off parts of your formation. Or, um, I don't know if there's a good example over here, some of these will prevent you from running certain types of characters. Um, I don't know if I have a good example of those over here, but some will be like, oh, you, can, you can't use any evil characters this time, or you can't, you can only use people from uh, this particular sort of like campaign adventure group, or, or, or you can't use them from a certain campaign adventure group, which forces you to rethink your strategy for that particular run. You can save your formations. So if I, um, if I were coming back into here, I have, I have some saved formation with different ideas for things. So if I click on this, it, what it's gonna do, it's going to reorganize things. As I unlock these guys, they're all going to unlock into the correct area for the formation that I've just loaded up over here. Um, and I can I can toggle. I can be like, you know what? I'm going to change ideas over here. Uh, this actually just removed your laxel because in this formation, he's not meant to be there. So it removed it. But if I had multiple things or if some formation used um, used a uh, like a different character from the slot, then it would switch the, the, the variants around and reorganize things for you. So you can save these. You can actually save like any number of them, but you've got five or three uh, hotkeys over here to rapidly load them. It even remembers where your, uh, your familiars are. So, um, so yeah, and some formations are going to work really well in the early days, uh, but hit a wall, and then you're going to use a different formation that wouldn't work on your first few runs because you didn't have enough gold to make it work. But once you get to a certain critical mass of gold, and then you can get a certain key DPS character in play, then you base your formation around that. The other thing that matters is, hey, what character have you unlocked items for? Jarlaxle does really well for me because I do have an epic on him. The swa Swashbuckling Rapier of Last Resort is dramatically boosting his damage. So Jarlaxle is a really um, um, reliable DPS for me right now. But as I get purples up on my other characters, we'll get more of that. It's also like a crap ton of achievements that you can get um, that will boost your permanent damage across all campaigns a lot. Uh, the favor, which translates to your gold find, you can also spend it on buffs over here. Uh, there are a lot of warnings here. If I try to spend on something ridiculously expensive, um, there we go. I get a warning here because if you're going to spend more than 1% of your favor, the game warns you because probably it's not a good idea to do that. Um, I think I spent on my double damage over here when it was a little more expensive than I could potentially justify, but this does boost your damage across all campaigns because this favor is only for this campaign. Torm's favor and this gold multiplier is only for the Grand Tour of the Frog Hunter Realms. If I went into a different campaign, including the, um, the event that's currently going on, it has its own favor mechanic. So I haven't done anything, for example, in Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. So if I were to load this up, ooh, it's telling me right away, hey, this is going to be really uh, quite difficult um, because the game sort of looks at uh, all the um, all the items that you have equipped on all your champions and then tries to figure out how hard of a time. Basically, it's telling me, it's not that I would have a hard time right away. It's that for to complete this, I'd have to get to area 100 and the game thinks, yeah, you probably won't be able to do that. Now, what I could do is I could keep grinding some of these others, open more chests, get more items on my characters, or I could decide to just start on this, um, probably do fine for a few levels. So we got these rabbits in here, they got 20 HP, um, and there you go, my Brunor is hitting for 56. So he's gonna be one-shotting these rabbits, that's fine. And I mean, my click damage isn't enough to kill anything, but as we pick up gold, you can see I'm picking up one gold at a time. I have no gold multiplier. So it's going to be quite painful for me to, I gotta kill five of these things just to level up Brunor one time, which is gonna increase his damage, admittedly, 
But right now he's, he's one-shotting things, so that's not a big deal. Um, but it would be nice to get up to more click damage, but 50 is insane. We got these little uh, distractions we can click as well for some bonus gold, which might be okay. So I could do this. I probably, I, I might not get very far. I probably won't get to level 100, but what I can do is I get as far as I can, then complete the adventure and earn some favor, uh, which will give me more gold find, which might be put me in a better position to move forward. I don't feel a particular rush to go through this right now, but I could. Um, I'm getting overwhelmed by rabbits here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a bunch of familiars. I've got four familiars. I'm going to throw them in here. So now they're clicking 20 times a second. And hey, there you go. Brunor is going to be doing just fine now because my familiars are actually going to be doing all the work that's necessary to do that. Hey, great. We're going to go to the next level over here. By the way, there's a little arrow here that you can do to auto progress, which I have on. Otherwise, I'd have to click the yellow arrow when I want to do it. I could stay on the same level if I'm worried about advancing. I could stay on the same level, but generally speaking, there's no reason not to push forward. And if you do run into a wall where you can't feel like you can progress, you just can't clear a wave. Uh, first of all, if your characters die, all you do is you back up to the start of this particular little leg, right? If I die on this boss, it'll send me back to level one. If I'm on level 155 and die on the boss, then it'll send me back to level 151 or whatever, just part of this little section. So there's no really great penalty to losing. But the thing is, if you can't get through a level, then you're not really going to be increasing your gold gain. And it's better to just bow out of the adventure and then um, then you'll you'll have increased your gold fine, then go right back in. If you're going to gain a ton more gold, then by the time you get to that same level, 155 or whatever it was, your characters are all going to be considerably more powerful. And hey, maybe you'll have earned enough gems to unlock a few chests as well, which might get you some more items. So those are ways to kind of get through some of these things. So um, in here, what I could do is I could see how far I could get with this particular character and hopefully get a little bit of favor in here. I think I can get favor even if you don't win. I just don't know how much gold I need to start increasing that. But hey, there we go. I can unlock uh, Celeste over here and her base damage is huge, especially with the items that she's got. So she's also definitely going to be one shotting things over here. And, you know, I've got twice as many attackers, so I'm, they're going to be attacking twice as quickly. That's great. You'll notice things do get stun locked a little bit from taking damage. So even if you're not doing enough click damage to kill anything, it's still nice to have those in there. By the way, you can deploy these here. I can deploy it here and here. Now, all of a sudden, what they're going to be doing is they're going to be auto-leveling up these characters whenever I have enough money for that. So I can level up my click, level up this. Hey, do something like that. What's the uh, composition over here? That's an interesting layout. I don't know what we're going to end up with uh, for this, but we could probably plan on probably we'll use this slot here for DPS. I've never, clearly, I've never done this campaign, so I didn't come in with a plan. You know, have Bruno here so we can buff this slot. She buffs everyone adjacent, so again, buff the DPS. Looks like we have three tanks up front, maybe. We don't have to use tank slots there, but that's quite interesting because there is a character in here that um, gets increased damage for each um, each tank she's next to, although I guess she'd still only be next to two in this particular configuration. But there's a few other buffs going on. So anyway, um, Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realm. I've been having a lot of fun with this. I it's I like the semi idleness. I you know you leave it in the background. You sort of you check in. You know every every so often you see there's progress made. You click some buttons. You feel good about it. Um, it's kind of wonderful. And um, oops, there we go. Da, da, da. But there's there's some strategy. It's not just you know a mindless kicking game. Clicking game because the formations are quite cool. And I like that. You keep having to reset your expectations of what your formation will be, depending on what campaign and what the actual layout is. But also, as your characters, you know, as you get more powerful, more gold find, it becomes more and more viable to use some of the later slotted champions in there. Anyway, I hope I didn't forget anything in here that I meant to talk about. Um, I'm going to go and farm some more uh, event stuff from Simril over here. This is only around for, I think these events only run for like two weeks or through two weekends or something like that. I think two weeks is the way they work. Um, and uh, there's champions that can only be unlocked uh, during these events. I have unlocked them all, but um, also these events are the best way to get more items for these uh, these champions. So crawl is quite cool. I would like to uh, this, even though it's free play, the events work a little bit different in that you can repeat this goal over and over. So every time I get to at least level 50 in here, uh, it will give me another chest for for crawl, uh, which means I could reset after 50, but I might still want to gr grind for more favor for a variety of different reasons. The difference with the events is that you do need these candles over here to actually start. So you need to have enough of them. I currently have 6,000, so I'm okay here. Um, so, but you could run out of these candles and then you go, you have to go and grind one of the uh, the regular campaigns. Doesn't matter what you play, you get you get candles at a very at a specific rate. Doesn't matter what level you are or what campaign you're in, you get candles at the same rate. Um, so you can just do that until you've got enough to redo it. Uh, 2,500 is the max here. It'll start at 500 and then go up by 500 every time you repeat the same one. Uh, and then it caps out. So um, what I could do and what I probably will do is I will probably uh, run these two. 
until they're 2,500 each. I don't particularly care about Luscious. Okay, it's probably Lucius, but Luscious or Yorvin as much. Um, so I don't really care about these chest rewards, but I'm going to farm these for extra favor so I get more gold fine and then probably just keep pushing the crawl one, um, get the chest at 50 and then decide if I'm resetting or getting more favor. I do want to do all of these variants because these variants will get you gold chests for those characters. So what I'm really looking to do is grind enough favor in this campaign as a whole, regardless of what individual adventure I do. I want to grind enough a favor in the campaign as a whole to get enough gold fine to make it possible for me to do these variants and get these gold chests uh and then we'll see um because i just i started playing like the day simril started i think um most likely i don't have enough tempo like my characters my champions aren't powerful enough because i didn't have enough items to um i might not be able to finish all these variants before the event ends uh but we'll see and then whenever the next event starts then I'll have new champions to unlock, and hopefully I'll be in a better position to power through absolutely everything then. That's it. That's all. Again, don't play this game. It's way too addictive. Do not recommend. It's, it's a hell of a lot of fun and very, very satisfying. Folks, thanks a lot for watching. I'm going to see you guys next time. Bye-bye.